Hello. Struggling a little bit with technical difficulties. Um, just want to make sure you all can hear me and see me here. Looks like things should be working, so I will continue here. Welcome. This is a talk on SSH. It's about learning to manage servers more efficiently from the command line. So this is uh, not a super advanced topic, but this is for folks who are maybe just getting into managing Linux. And uh, this is talking about using the command line and SSH. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm John Bonicio, and uh, I'm one of the trainers with the Linux Foundation, and um, I'll have my information at the end of the talk. So uh, let's just get started here. So SSH is a protocol for many applications. So SSH is kind of short for secure shell, uh, but it's more than just a shell. It's about a, having a protocol for connecting in. And of course, it is a way to have secure sale, but it can do so much more than that. And so you can use it for a remote command line shell, but you can also use it for copying files. Uh, you can use it for um, creating tunneling and VPNs. You can mount remote file systems through the protocol and more. A little bit about history here. Uh, it started out uh, in the early 60s. They had a, a, a protocol called Telnet, and it was uh, insecure, old text base. You could kind of sniff the packets on the wire and see just about everything going on in there. So you could connect in and remotely uh, do things on the computer, but it was pretty unsafe, not very secure. Uh, then they created this uh, other set of tools there that made it a little bit easier to work with, a little bit better than Telnet, still was text-based, still not secure. So in the 80s, they had R login, RSH, and RCP. And so this way you could remote login or create a remote shell or remotely copy files. And they also had ability to automatically log in from trusted machines, worked better than Telnet, uh, certain characters and commands kind of went through better, whereas Telnet, I think, didn't interpret certain characters very well. Uh, so people liked it better than Telnet, but they still have this issue with the security. So finally, they came out with SSH. I don't think they called it SSH-1 back then. I think it was just SSH. Um, and it was kind of the first iteration of it. Uh, it was secure. It's an encrypted protocol, came out in the early 90s, and it was a replacement for R login, RSH, and RCP. And they had a number of uh, encryption algorithms that they used listed here. It uses public keys uh, to identify the machines. So um, it was pretty good. Although some of the encryption algorithms in there were maybe not quite as good, so they came out with SSH version 2. So SSH version 2 came out in the 1990s. Uh, they kept some of the encryption algorithms, uh, removed some others that were not as secure, and added some new ones that were possible in it. It's backwards compatible with SSH version 1, uh, and had better encryption for the keys themselves. And so for SSH 1, the keys it came through in plain text, so you can see those, but SSH2 also encrypts the public keys that it uses uh, in its algorithms. So why use SSH? So compared to some tools, um, like using connecting and using the command line, uh, SSH uh, provides some kind of a, a better way, I think, to manage a machine, especially if you're managing a bunch of machines. So it is secure. Note that nothing is completely unbreakable, so nothing is, is totally 100% secure, so always keep that in mind. You know, it's uh, everything can be hacked. It's just a matter of uh, how much machine power and time that they have, and eventually they can get through. 
Uh, other reasons to use SSH, SSH though, is you can script operations that are used a lot. So if there's a sequence of commands and operations that you use often together, you can put that all in a script and just automatically run all of those together. And you can manage multiple machines at once. We'll talk briefly a little bit about that at the end of the talk. Um, but if you have a whole bunch of machines you're managing, you can actually send commands to more than one, uh, a bunch of machines and get back answers and, and manage multiple machines all, all at the same time. Rather than one after the other, you can do it at the same time. And it kind of lets you peek under the hood. So a lot of operations, uh, when you manage Linux, there's kind of an underlying way for things to work. And so if you're using like a graphical interface or maybe a web-based tool, if you're getting errors and it's not working, it might be kind of hard to, to figure out what is not working about it. And then the SSH getting on the command line kind of lets you peek under the hood, so to speak, and get in there and figure out what's actually going on why are you getting that error from the graphical environment or from uh, the, the web-based tool that you're using to manage your machines? So what you can do with SSH, you can run a remote shell, a command line. You can run a single command remotely, with just one shot. You can use uh, rsync for backup and restore. So use rsync over SSH. You can create a VPN which we're not gonna talk about here in this talk. You can mount a remote file system using a special SSHFS. You can copy files to and from a machine using a tool called SCP. You can set up passwordless logins from trusted machines. You know, you gotta be careful with this. Um, this does create an opening for um, where your machines could be hacked through this mechanism here. But if you're all within a, a single VPN, it should be safe to be able to manage multiple machines um, through that. Next is what talks about where you can use SSH. And as you can see in here, SSH is not just a Linux thing. You can use SSH on Mac and Windows. And so this here talks about a number of clients that you can use for SSH. Uh, so if you're on Windows, you can set up SSH to connect to your Linux machines or, you know, other combinations in there. But so there's, there's some, some SSH clients. There's more out there, but uh, these are ones that I think are a little bit more common that folks use. There's PuTTY. Um, PuTTY allows you to SSH into a server, and it also allows other ways of connecting as well. So it's not just an SSH tool. But uh, I think a lot of people who are familiar with a graphical environment really like PuTTY. It's got a nice interface. It's a nice way to set up settings and to connect and then open up a window for command line operations for you. Or you could just plain old use SSH from the command line. So you open up the command line, type SSH, uh, you specify your username, and then use the at symbol, and then the IP address or you know, the domain name of the machine, and you can connect and it'll ask for your password, unless you've set up that passwordless connection type of mechanism and get right in there. It's probably the simplest way, if you're comfortable in the command line, just to remote connect through SSH. And then there's Drop Bear. Um, you can use that. There's binaries for Linux and Mac. Windows, it sort of kind of works. It's kind of, uh, I think, funky to get working. You have to get it to work in Windows in a SIGWIN environment is more effort than there. And of course, there's other, other clients that you can get. Uh, some of them are you know, paid for software, um, but you can, you can get others as well. On the server, there's options as well for the server side. And so you can just use open SSH. Uh, it's open source software to SSH in that runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, uh, all these different options. Drop Bear can also operate as a server. There's also free SSHD and others. So I just listed a few in here. So on Linux, to set up uh, open SSH, uh, you would go into your, if you did it from the command line, uh, you would run as root using the sudo operation here. And you would use you know that your, your package manager for your distribution 
So if you're using a Debian-based distribution like Ubuntu, you'd use Apt, or if you're using you know, Fedora, Red Hat, those kinds of things, it might be Yum or DNF or others. Whatever you tool you use for your packaging system, you use that and then use install open SSH server. So that installs the software. If it's not already there, uh, it'll install that. If it's already there, it'll just tell you it's already there, which is, which is fine. So it doesn't hurt to run the command even if it's installed. And then if you're using uh, the system D based uh, startup using that, you use system control and then enable SSH. And then system control start SSHD and you're all set. Your server is set, pretty simple. Not too many operations there to set up. And by doing this, this will set up your keys automatically for you. So it'll go generate a key and assign it to your server. For client from the command line, uh, you would just install OpenSSH client. Um, and, uh, or uh, I think some distributions have the S on it, OpenSSH clients, depending on the name of the package for your distribution. Uh, when I searched, that's kind of what I found there. And then once you're there on the client, you just SSH. This is doing it from the command line. Put in your username and then at server.com as an example or username at and then give it an IP address. So if you're first time connecting through SSH, um, it will tell you uh, that it doesn't have a key for this server and uh, it'll give you the key that it found on the server and it says are you sure you want to continue and uh, then you answer yes or no and uh, once you've stayed, said yes it stores this key on your machine this is one of the things that make ssh more secure and that keeps the key and if you log in again and and the key is different than the one you've stored it will alert you and so it prevents like man in the middle attacks and that sort of thing So let's talk about some commands. So this talk is not just about SSH, but it's about using the command line to manage your machines. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go through some commands uh, that you can use to monitor your machines and do different things here. So this first set of commands is how do you find out what processes are running on the machine? Uh, you can use PS, there's different ways you can pass options to it. This is one way here, we can do dash A, which lists all the processes. They come out of the command line and you can see them they give you process IDs and the process names, and they come out in a big list. You can also use tools like TOP. TOP will uh, produce a list of all the processes on the machine sorted by CPU utilization. And it will refresh every couple of seconds. And so you sit there, you can watch, and you can see tasks bubble up to the top and then drop back down a bit, and they kind of migrate around as they're executing in for instance, if you think a machine is has like a runaway process that's using too much CPU, that'll be pegged at the top. You can see how much CPU it's using. It might say 100% CPU, uh, and then you can kill the process in the interface if that's something that's needed. HTOP is another kind of tool you can use, a very similar to top. Uh, it's actually the display I find a little bit nicer than just regular top, uh, but it's very similar in the way it works. And so it's also sorted by CPU percentage and updates every so often. Um, so those are a few ways you can monitor and kill processes on your machines. So just some things about the command line, just to give an overview of it here. Uh, command line has a prompt. Typically it's a dollar symbol if it's you're logged in as your regular user account, or it's this pound symbol here, this hash symbol if you're logged in as a root. And that's kind of just a visual cue as to how you're logged in. When you're logged in as a root, you can do anything. And so it helps you be alert, be a little more cautious. Some commands could like wipe everything out. So you wanna be careful and pay attention to uh, what, what way you're logged in here. When you're at the command line, there is a current working directory that you're in. Oftentimes that directory is listed on the command prompt as well. So it shows you your directory that you're in uh, and then it gives you the prompt so you can kind of see where you're working. But not always, sometimes you log in and it doesn't display that. The command prompt can be customized and can show different things. It 
can just be the prompt only. You type commands at the prompt, so it's typing commands in. Yeah, it's typing. It might be cumbersome. Um, at first, it might feel awkward um, if, if you're new to the command line. But I think after a while, uh, at least for me, I found I got pretty used to it, and the commands are pretty, pretty second nature. And I find I can do things faster at the command line than through the graphical interface. The graphical interface, I have to move the mouse around and get it over to wherever I need to click on, get some menus down, pull down the menu, go over here, opens up a box, and then I select some options, and I click a button to make it go. And that's for me, is much slower than just typing a command at the command line. Commands, when you run them, are programs that launch mostly. So uh, sometimes they're built-in commands. You, you type a command, and it's the command shell, the command line program you're inside will interpret the command and uh, will just do what it what it says to do. Um, but you can also, uh, it'll often also just run a program. So we'll find a program on the disk and launch that. When you run a program, the programs will take options. The options are dash, letter, or a series of letters for each option is its own letter. Um, or you can use dash, dash, and use longer words. The longer words are easier to read. It's more typing, though. So some people get used to the single letters and use those. Getting help on commands, um, you can use command dash dash help on most commands. It'll tell you how to use it. Uh, there's also this tool out there called man, which is short for manual. And that lets you get uh, help on commands. Uh, so you type man and then the name of the program, the command that you have here, and it'll give you a whole uh, screen for more of information about how to use the command. There's also a tool called info, and that gives information on the command as well. It's very similar to the information in man. It's formatted a little, little nicer uh, with kind of multiple screens. You can jump from one section to the next, whereas man is just a big list where you scroll up and down. But they're pretty close to one another. I don't have it on the screen here, but sometimes you don't know what the command is. You're not quite sure. Like, I forget what's the command to list files, for instance. Um, you can use man, and, and there's some options. I think it's dash K for it to search, and you can search through the man pages for keywords in there, and then it'll come up with a, a result, a search result, and you go, oh, well, there it is. That's the command I'm looking for. And then you can type man on the command. So that's a way to kind of help get started. Of course, you can always look on the internet, too. A lot of the man page information are stored in various websites on the internet. And so you can go you know, into your, your favorite search engine and type in, uh, Linux, and how do I list files? And you'll have an answer there as well. Like if you're totally brand new, that there is help out there. So here's some examples here. You can do ls dash dash help. ls is the program to list files. And uh, this will show you how to use ls, where all the options are and how they make ls behave and all of that. Or you can type man space ls. And that gives uh, more detailed information usually than you get with the dash dash help. Dash dash helps usually kind of pared down to keep it fast. On the command line, commands can be chained together. So you can use piping. That's what it's called. So you use this vertical bar character. And you use the vertical bar character. The output of the first command becomes the input into the second command. So you can chain commands together using this method called piping and create a pipe between these processes. As an example, we have ls-l, so the l is a long listing, and then we're piping through less, which is a pager, which gives you one page at a time and lets you see a page, and then you can put, press space or enter, and then let it progress through and give you more information uh, in there. But you can pipe it through sort or other tools as well. Commands can be chained on the back line back on the command line itself using this back tick character. There's, in this case, the output of the second command becomes the parameter list into the first command. So example here, uh, here's using a grepping tool. This is a way for searching, searching inside files. We're searching for the keyword Bob. And we're going to search through the files that find tool over here finds. So find is going to look for files from the current directory and we search the whole directory tree 
searching just through files uh, that are named with the extension .text. And so then we're searching for the keyword Bob in all of the text files with this here. And that makes searching much faster. You can also chain commands in scripts. In scripts, you can uh, go ahead and run a sequence of commands and they're chained together in various ways. Sometimes it's just a sequence, run this command and then run this other one. Uh, but you can chain uh, together commands, uh, like as an example here in the script, you can use this for loop. And in this case, we're going to uh, give a listing of all the modules on the kernel uh, in the, on the machine that we're running in here. And so these are all the modules that are loaded. Uh, all, you know, a lot of modules are drivers or other kernel code that's loaded late. So this will get a list of all those modules. Um, again, we're chaining LS mod, we're piping through awk pull out the first, uh, the first field out of the listing in here. We're going to echo the name uh, here, this dollar mod, name of the module is found. And then we're going to run mod info to get information about the module. And we're going to grep for the keyword license. So in this case, this little script in here prints the licenses of all the modules on our machine. Kind of handy little tool. And so this is a script. Sometimes we just call them shell scripts. Command line sometimes is called a shell, so you're aware. So here's some more commands. Here we can get the current working directory. A lot of times this is pointed on the command prompt, so you really don't need to type this. But if you want to get this information in a script, for instance, you can use this command here. Here's print working directory. For example, it might print we're in the home student directory here. You can change the current working directory with a cd command. So CD into documents, and then as a result uh, here, you don't really see anything, but I'm showing them the command prompt. So your login name at server name, colon, and then the name of the path that we're on the current working directory, and then we get a prompt. You can list files with LS. I showed you a little bit about that earlier. LS is short, short for list. So listing files, here's a list of files and directories uh, in my home directory here. And that would just happen to be my current working directory. On LS, uh, it doesn't show it here, but you can put pass in the directory to get a listing in. And so you can you know, pass that as a parameter, an option to LS. It doesn't have to be the current working directory. There's a couple ways to find things on the machine. You can search using that find tool. I showed that in the example in the print licenses script earlier. Uh, for find, you say find, and then uh, you give it a directory to search. In this case, it's the slash etc directory for configuration. And then we're going to search for any file with SSH in the name. So find is you give a directory name, and then you give it uh, search parameters. So you can use <clears throat> dash name, dash type, um, dash date, different options in there for finding files. And you could type man on find to get a list of all the options on how to use find. But here's an example here. We're finding all the files in the etc directory that have SSH in the name. These are the list of files that are likely used for configuring SSH. There might be others that also do it, but we probably do it for sure. You can also search inside files it's using this tool called grep. So this searches inside files for text inside of it. So here we're grepping for the keyword port inside the etc directory ssh, sshd config. So this might be a sequence of commands I've run where I want to find out uh, what is the port setting on my ssh server. It seems to not be working, perhaps. And so I'm looking for the config files because maybe I don't remember what they're called. And then I'm looking inside the config file for how the port is set. And it looks like we have a couple lines in here that have the keyword port in it. It looks like it's set to 22, which probably is the default. And so it looks like it's supposed to be set for port 22 here. So here's some more commands. Oh, I had uh, a little bit this earlier here. So this is a little bit repeat. So yeah, you can list uh, commands using uh, get listings of processes on your system using ps, ps-a, top, h top. I talked about those earlier. Uh, and you can kill processes uh, inside the top tool or h top. 
Um, you can highlight the process you want to kill, and uh, I believe it's like F9 to uh, kill the process, and it asks you if you really want to kill it, you say yes. And uh, I think that works both in top and each top. You can also do it from the command line, so you can kill and give it its PID. It's just a number associated with the process. You can get a list of files opened by a process. So there's a tool called LSOF that lists open files. You can chain it together with this searching tool for, called grep here, searching for a process name. As an example, we can see what files does Firefox have open, typing LSOF gripping for Firefox, and then we'll get some a listing of files. Um, for brevity here, so I didn't overrun the whole screen, I just show a few of the entries that came back. It's not everything, there's more than this. Maybe you want to find out what process has a file open. So again, you can use LSOF and then give a file path to the file. So in this case, uh, because of the file I'm trying to look at here, I need to have root permissions to access it. So I run it under sudo, which we've not talked about here, but you can get information about how sudo works. Uh, and then this here, this shows that I have this program called Synaptic Open and running, and it's got this file here open. So this is like that, uh, maybe not too infamous, but uh, periodically, you know, in Ubuntu, you're trying to install packages and it says that this file is locked. I can't get access to the packaging database. And you're like, oh man, what's going on? And you can run a command like this to find out what has this thing locked. You can find out which process has a network port opened using lsof-i, which will give information about ports. You can give colon and then the port number. So example here, these is the uh, there are the processes that have port 5900 open here. You can find out about memory utilization. So you can type the, the keyword free, command free. It gives information about memory total, memory used, how much is free, how many pages are shared, how many pages are in the buffer cache for block and disk IO on there. And then this is how many pages are in the swap space. You can find out about IO load. And so in here, we can run IOSTAT. IOSTAT will give information um, about IO operations. So it has your average CPU uh, utilization here, percentage of the time in user space, uh, how much in system space in here, how many processes are waiting on IO and so forth here. <clears throat> and then we'll show these devices. Uh, the listing here, the ellipses indicate, you know, snipped out some of the output. So kept it simple here. But uh, like here, SDA is the hard drive, and this is talking about load on the hard drive here. You can also use IO top. It's kind of like top for processes, but this is top for IO load. And this will show you which process is doing the most IO on the system. Again, it'll update every couple of seconds. You can kind of see over time which processes are using the most uh, I.O. on the system. Find out about CPU utilization using MPSTAT. Oop, I got I.O. top here. This should be MPSTAT. The example here shows it here, MPSTAT. Um, and then here, this shows uh, CPU, uh, how it's being used, CPU utilizations, and kind of percent time in user space, percent time in system space, and all of that. So finally, we kind of get to this managing multiple servers, which I think is uh, one of the kind of the magic things about SSH, especially if you're managing multiple machines. Um, and you can use uh, parallel SSH, Tmux. There are other options out there. Um, when I looked, PSSH seemed to be the easiest to set up and use. You just install it. Uh, using your packaging tool, and then you create a hosts file. This example here, we just called it dot .pssh host file. We kept it hidden with the dot. 
um, in there. It doesn't have to be hidden. You can do however you want there with the file, but in there you give a, a list of files. So their IP addresses, um, their, you know, their, their machine names, uh, whatever it would pass on SSH to get to a machine, you know, maybe a machine is, you know, my, my domain.com or whatever. That's how you get to the machine. However you get to it, it'd go in the host file. So the host file would list all of the machines that you want to manage. Uh, an example, I just put in a couple of them, but it could be more. Could be 100 machines, however many you have in there. Um, when you have this, though, uh, you do need to set up the passwordless login for each of these machines so you can SSH in without having to type the password each time. And uh, so you, you set up keys, have not gone into that. Uh, again, you can get man on SSH or look online. Uh, and it's a matter of putting, getting a key for your client, which is usually auto-generated the first time you log in. So the first time you SSH into a server, you get the server's key and your client also gets a key that is generated uh, and you can get your key and then you install your key on the server machine so it knows which keys are safe. So these would be machines inside the same VPN, the same building, uh, the same local network where it's, it's secure. You can trust it that it's not coming from some machine out there on the internet. Uh, and so the server has these keys, uh, these machines that are trusted that are already set up in there. So that is set up, and then you have this host file. And you can type PSSH, um, and then there's some options here uh, that you pass in, and then you pass in a command to run on each of the machines uh, that are run remotely, the ones in this list of these hosts, in this host file here. And they'll run this mpstat, for instance, on each of the remote machines. And so it'll come back, and it'll have like one, and said the, the command ran successfully, Here's its IP address on the command prompt, whatever here. Um, this is, I think this is coming from the host file. And then here it gives the output of mpstat, comes out with the stanza for it. And then it goes on to the next machine. And then here's machine number two, and it's giving mpstat down over here. So these two different machines, one with four CPUs, one with 24, and so forth in here. And you can do all kinds of things with this to monitor all of their machines all at once. And so you can get in there and find CPU utilization, how our machine's running over there, <clears throat> go in and run free and find out how much memory is available, uh, get information on how much hard drive space is available, <clears throat> all just by typing simple commands and having it run on all of your remote machines all at the same time. Uh, so you don't need to go into this machine, run some commands, cut to the next machine. You don't have to do it one after the other. Um, you can do it all in parallel here, which is, uh, I think, pretty great for managing machines. So now it's time for questions and answers. So I'm not sure how this interface works for you guys. I think you can type, uh, if you're connected remotely, you can type in chat, I believe, and you can ask questions. Question is, uh, how do we get slides for this session? Um, uh, I believe the slides will be made available uh, for folks. Um, I'm not sure what the mechanism is for that, but um, my understanding is through, through most of these conferences, the slides get submitted, and then there's a place you can go online and <clears throat> find your talk and get the slides. Any other questions? Well, awesome. So I'll go to the last slide here. So uh, let's see. No, it's just a slide here. Right here, if you want to write down my name and email address, if you have further questions, uh, simple questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, you guys have been great. And enjoy the conference.
let's see. I think I have a question here in the, uh, in the chat. It's kind of bleeding over. Uh, so question in chat. I finally see him. Yeah, this is our SSH keys more secure <clears throat> than saving passwords in the machine uh, you control the other machines. <clears throat> yeah, I think the SSH keys would be more secure than passwords. The, the uh, <clears throat> So, you know, nothing is totally secure, you know, with enough resources, somebody can get in and, and get stuff. Um, but the SSH keys uh, are more secure than plain text passwords on the machine, um, depending on how that's done. Um, so I, I think the, the, the keys uh, typically have some security around the file. So the SSH keys, you know, not just anybody can read those <clears throat> generally unless, unless they get root access in your machine. Um, but I would, I would prefer that than just having passwords on the machine. Okay, I'm looking through to see if there's any other questions in here. All right, if I'm missing your question, Type it in again. Right. I might hang out just for a few more minutes in case people have questions. But if you're if you're ready to move on to the next session, have a good rest of the day and enjoy the content. All right, it looks like we're done. So take care.